So tonight, we're going to continue on the series we've been talking about. Uh, Pastor, if you're here on Sundays, Pastor Al has also been talking about who's your one. Um, the whole idea of who's your one is, um, is about pushing us towards evangelism, about encouraging us to reach out to people who don't know Jesus and to share the message of the gospel with them. Um, last week, we watched a video by Shane Pruitt, who encouraged us as students to share the gospel with people. Um, and then we had a time of reflection where you guys got the opportunity to pick someone in your life who you think doesn't know Jesus. And you had uh, wrote their name on the ping pong ball, put it in here. And so each one of these ping pong balls represents somebody in your life who doesn't know Jesus. And I hope that you have been praying and asking God for the opportunity to share the gospel message with that individual, whoever it may be. And I heard recently, I don't remember if this was Al that said it on Sunday or, or I heard it somewhere else. Um, but a lot of people um, use the excuse of I'm waiting on a door of opportunity to not share the gospel with somebody. They're like, the door, the door of opportunity is just an excuse for me not to share the gospel with somebody. I've been really convicted the last week or so um, about how am I sharing the gospel with people. I'm a pastor, and so you know I get up here on a stage each and every week, multiple times a week, and I share the gospel message with you guys. Uh, but how am I sharing the gospel message with people outside of this room, people in my life, people like the lady who cuts my hair, or people like the same girl I always see check out um, me, check me out, not looking-wise, but cash-wise, money-wise, at Belashino's. Every time I go to Belashino's, she's the person behind the register. And have I ever opened my mouth to share the gospel with her and not just thank her for my food? Or say, hey, make sure you give me my rewards on my grinder card, right? I've been convicted of how am I opening my mouth to share the gospel with people in my life, and I'm not. I'm really not doing that good at it. I'm really not very good at it. It's something that I really struggle with and have for my entire life. And so for me to get up here and preach that to you guys and for you to think that I've got it figured out is not okay. So I want to make sure you guys know, listen, I don't have this figured out. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a super outgoing, in your face, share the gospel. That's just not me. I know the purpose of it, and I want to equip you guys to do that, and I want to get better at it myself. And so this journey that we're taking on who's your one is for me as much as it is for you guys. God is just using me as a, a voice as, uh, to share this with you guys. In the New Testament, Jesus three times gives the disciples a command. He says, go into all the world, baptizing people in my name, sharing the gospel with them. I'm paraphrasing and raising them up as disciples of Jesus Christ. This is the command that Jesus gives us three times in the New Testament. He clearly states, this is the mission that I have given you. Right? When, when, people, when students ask me, what's the meaning of life, or what am I supposed to do with the rest of my life, I, my answer is always glorify God in anything that you do. Whether you're uh, an astronomer, a nurse, uh, a tire mechanic, whatever you do, glorify God in that and that's half true. The other half is you are to share the message of the gospel with people you come into contact with. You are to share the story of Jesus with people in your life. Almost six years ago, on October 24th, 2015, I gave an invitation to a woman, and I asked her to marry me. Her name's Rachel. She's sitting right there, the blonde-headed lady. That is my wife. Um, I asked her to marry me. She gave me an emphatic yes, all excited. I, I meant to put a picture up here on it, but we'll share that later on the LBT students' Instagram if you want to check that out. Um, so I forgot to put that up here. And the whole point of that is I gave an invite, the invite for my life to be changed. And then me and Rachel together sent out wedding invitations to people that meant something to us who we wanted to be at our wedding in front of us, in front of God, when we made vows to each other. We, I invited her. We invited people. Invitations are part of life. And um, here's the thing about invitations. Invitations require an answer. Invitations require an answer. 
Um, invitations are articulating something to someone that then requires a decision. Myself, your parents get junk mail all of the time asking us to partake in somebody's company or to buy something from somebody or something. Uh, here's a universal truth about invitations. Unissued invitations are always ignored. Meaning if you don't give an invitation to somebody, they're never going to have the opportunity to respond to that invitation. They'll never have the opportunity to respond to that invitation. An invitation is always uh, articulated. It's always verbally given or written to people. That's what an invitation looks like. There's three characteristics of an invitation. First off, invitations are always articulated, spoken, or written. Um, secondly, they're structured. Who, what, when, where, how. They also are results-oriented, mean yes or no or no answer. No answer is still an answer, but when an invitation is given, an answer is required, whether it's yes, no, or unanswered. And here's the thing. The gospel is an invitation. The gospel is an invitation. The message of Jesus Christ, of his death, burial, and resurrection is an invitation. It's an invitation um, spoken or written to join the family of God. It's an invitation to go from death to life. When Paul wrote Romans 10, he said, we preach or proclaim the gospel, we voice it. We don't pantomime, charade, or act out the gospel. Listen, when you win a game against somebody in sports, you're gonna make sure they know it, right? You're gonna be yelling and hollering and excited and rah, 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 and it's just gonna be intense. Yesterday, we were at a game. And it was probably the loudest game I've heard in that gym. We were at uh, uh, the Eagles gym over in Alger watching a game. And these guys over here were just l so loud. And I'm like, that's what it looks like to share the gospel. It's to be loud and to let people know this is the message of the gospel. This is what Jesus is about. And because we're not, listen, wearing a Christian t-shirt or carrying your Bible to school or saying a quick prayer, silent prayer before your lunch, hoping people are going to see you. Guys, I'm just being honest with you. That's not very good of a testimony. I used to do the same thing, but that's not enough. It's not enough to wear a Christian t-shirt, to have a Christian bumper sticker, to whatever it is. You've got to be vocal. You've got to share with your mouth or written, because sometimes it can be done through, you know, typing or, or writing something out, but you've got to communicate the invitation of the gospel. Um, there's a lot of fear and unsureness in articulating our faith. Um, I th I'm right there with you guys. It's sometimes scary and requires a lot of faith to step out of our comfort zone, to go to a place that we've never been, to talk to somebody we don't know. Heck, it's even difficult to, sh to share the gospel with somebody that's not saved, and you've known them your, your whole life. There's people that you've known your whole life that don't know Jesus, and it is so difficult. It's probably more difficult for you to share the gospel with them because you're afraid that you're going to get a no as a response, or you're going to get rejected, and how that's going to impact your relationship. But here's the thing. We're meeting people oftentimes in their biggest fear, in their worst depression, in their biggest anxiety, and we have the answer. You and I have the answer. If you, and, if you know Jesus, you have the answer to life's problems. His name is Jesus. It's the message of the gospel. And so tonight, I want to share with you some tools of how to share your faith. Some tools of how to share your faith. Because like I said, it can be intimidating. It can be scary. It can be fearful. And so some tools to help you. Um, is we have the New Testament in antiquity. The New Testament in antiquity. I actually used this book in my recent paper on persecution in the early church between the first and sixth centuries. Uh, this tells you the historical context of the New Testament, right? So you, make sure you read all of this. And then we have the Moody Handbook of Theology. How about that? How's that sound? Make sure you read all of that. And then we have, uh, this one is one I first got when I got into college. This is Basic Theology, an unpo or a Popular Systematic Guide to Understanding Biblical Truth by Charles Ryrie. I will tell you, I have read maybe five pages in this entire book. 
all right? Listen, the point is, you don't need all of this to share the gospel. You don't need a four years bachelor's degree in Christian studies to share the gospel. You don't need this. All you really need is some Chick-fil-A or, or Taco Bell or lunch at school. Maybe it's that cafeteria pizza that you just love. You know what I mean? All you really need is to have lunch with somebody, to get to know somebody, to build a relationship with the people in your life. Because if Jesus has moved in your life, then he can move through you. When you're getting to know someone at a lunch or at your school or in a classroom or anywhere, there's a simple illustration I want to share with you guys that you can write on anything. You can write it on your hand with a permanent marker. You can write it on a napkin. You can write it on a piece of paper. You can have it on your phone. There's an app for what I'm about to explain to you. This is a simple illustration of how to share the gospel with somebody in any sitting. All right? First thing is God's design. This is how God created the world. This is what we see in Genesis. God created the world with you and I supposed to be in relationship with him, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he also created animals, and he also created everything else, and he also created mankind and, and woman, and, and he created us to have a relationship and to be in an intimate relationship with him, right? But we know because of sin... Sin is anything that you've done wrong towards God. Anything, any act of disobedience that you've ever done wrong. Any act of disobedience. You stole a stick of gum from your friend and didn't tell him or ask for it. You lied at school about an assignment. You told a white lie about something. You stole something. You, I don't think anyone in here has done this, but you killed somebody. Whatever the sin is, sin because of sin, because you and I have done wrong. Listen, the Bible says that we have all sinned. Every one of us in here is a sinner. Every one of us in here has made mistakes. And because of sin, there's brokenness in the world. There's brokenness in the world. When you look around, you don't have to be a Christian to see the brokenness in the world. To see sex trafficking. To see abortions. To see people being killed for, for ridiculous things. To see people being um, raped. To see, you don't have to be a Christian to see brokenness in the world. God's design was not to, for a broken world. But because of sin, we live in a broken world. And because we live in a broken world, we tend to go search to fill that brokenness with things, in, uh, things that we can touch, taste, smell, experience. People, be, people, everyone will acknowledge that there's brokenness in the world, and they begin to search for, how do I fix this brokenness I feel inside of me? The anxiety, the depression, the fear. How do I fix that inside of me? But within, there's the gospel. The gospel is the answer to the brokenness in the world. The gospel is the answer to the brokenness in the world. Everything in this world that has gone wrong can be fixed with Jesus, can be fixed with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when a broken person or a broken people repent and believe in the gospel, when they repent and believe in the gospel, it takes us back to recovering and pursuing to God's design. It's full circle. We were created to be in a, in a relationship with God. Because of sin, sin separates us from God because of, and creates brokenness. And brokenness, oftentimes, we look for other things. But the only true thing that can fill the brokenness is the gospel. And so when we repent and believe in the gospel, we then can recover and pursue back to God's original design. When Jesus died for your sins, he died saying, I want these people to be back in a relationship with God. I want them to experience the fullness of life. I want them to experience what this life is about. And so because of the gospel, because of Jesus, we can recover and pursue to be original to God's design. 
And we can do that. And, and, and Jesus and God does this in us. They, 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 they walk the process with us to recover and pursue back to God's design. A few things about this illustration. First off, you can't have a conversation like this with somebody if you don't connect with somebody. The cashier at Belashino's, the lady who cuts my hair, if I don't talk to them, there's no way I can connect with them. There's no way that the, the door of opportunity will ever be opened for me to have this conversation with them. And so you have to have, in order to have meaningful conversations, conversations that lead to conversation about Jesus, you have to interact with people. And if you're an introvert, man, this is difficult. If you're an extrovert, it's a little bit easier, but it's still difficult. If you're an ambivert, which is what I am, then you just kind of have to fight this constantly depending on the circumstances. We have to have a meaningful conversation. We have to connect with people. Some things to remember when we do this, when we have these conversations, when I write this on a napkin or, or on my hand or explain it to somebody. First off, be normal. Don't be a freak. Don't be somebody who's going to run around and wave a napkin with this illustration on it at people, okay? Just because you wave in their face doesn't know they're going to know what it means, all right? Don't be, um, don't be running up to people in the mall and saying, if you die today, you're going to hell, okay? That's kind of creepy and freaks people out, okay? Don't do that, okay? Don't do that. Have, uh, have the desire to do that, but don't actually do it, okay? Because the desire to do that will lead you um, to your sphere of influence. That's the second thing is, your sphere of influence, where God has placed you, where you go to school, where you work one day, where you play sports, the team that you're on, God has given you a sphere of influence, and there are people in that sphere of influence that you need to be light to, that you need to share the gospel with those people. There's going to be people that Ethan encounters that I never encounter. There's going to be people that Steve encounters at Ford that I'm never going to meet. There's going to be people in our lives that you are going to be the only person that will ever be able to share Jesus with them. They're counting on you to share the gospel. They're counting on you to be a light in their life. And thirdly, to remember when we're having these conversations is be intentional. A lot of conversations, and this is extremely important for extroverts, a lot of conversations in life are idle, meaning you talk and you talk and you talk and it never goes anywhere. You never, you never have a point with your conversation. You may talk about sports. You may talk about your video games. You may talk about life, but you never re- the conversation never really leads anywhere other than, hey, how are you? I'm good. That's great. You have to lead the conversation into a meaningful one. You have, to take, you have to know how to take the conversation from being surface level about whatever you're connecting with them about, and then you have to take it meaningful and lead it in a different direction. So if you don't remember anything from today, remember that sharing the gospel is telling others what Jesus has done for you in your own life. Before we end, uh, I want to watch a video and uh, this video is inspiring and encouraging. Um, and then after this video, I'll come up and uh, close us out. going to introduce you to the gospel right now. You are a rebel. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, I'll tell you straight up. You are a rebel against the living God. This is your natural disposition. Why? Because you were born in sin. We are in a prison cell. And it takes the awakening and the grace of God, you call it the provenient grace of God, to awaken us to the fact that we are lost and we can't get out. We're headed towards destruction fast. The enemy, because of our rebellion against God, has legal rights to harm and harass our life. There you are behind the prison cell, help, I need out! You can't get out. Those prison bars are stronger than any adamant. There is no way you can cut them because they're stronger than diamond. It is impenetrable. You cannot escape. 
you're doomed because when the enemy comes in in the very end and he's going to finish you off because he has legal right to do it and he's going to relish every minute of it in strolls your intercessor your mighty man and he stands between you and that accuser and he takes the hit that was rightfully yours he takes the blow that was intended for you that is an extraordinary reality that he was turned to a pulp and he actually died god died for you over your prison cell it is always said condemned separated eternally from god guilty and then suddenly it switches when you realize what jesus christ has done it says justified it says forgiven redeemed Here's the problem. Most of us have stopped with the good news right there. The blood of Jesus Christ has been shed and he was killed. And I want you to know that is unbelievable news. But we are still in a prison cell. And so we're praising God from within a prison cell going, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for changing the sign on the outside of the prison. And God's word says, <clears throat> could you check the door? to the prison cell because my blood was shed for more than just forgiveness. Forgiveness was the avenue through which he could make the escape for us. He isn't just interested in dealing with the consequences or the penalty of sin. He's also dealt with the problem of sin. Test the door. It's unlocked. The door to the prison cell is unlocked. Walk out. Smell the open air of freedom and liberty in the life of Jesus Christ. When you get outside the prison cell, there's like this chariot that's waiting. Emissaries from the king, and they say, the king beckons you into his presence. You know how bizarre this is when you realize that you were a rebel, that you were undeserving completely. The living God has literally given up his life for you, and now he has set you free, and now, the very king is beckoning you into his presence. It's like, are you sure you have the right guy here? I'm a rebel. I, I stood against my God. I spat in his face. How, how could he want me? The king beckons you. You get in the chariot. And as you're pulling into the kingdom, you're looking for where they might drop you off. You're looking for that poor district. You're saying, where, where are you taking me? Well, into the very near presence of the king. He wants you to live right where he lives. Not just the penalty, not just the problem, but an invitation into his very near presence. But as you're coming in, the emissaries say, he wants to adopt you as his child. Me? As a child? We are brought in and invited near to share his heart. You come into his presence totally broken before the reality of what he has done for you. I don't deserve this. Why have you done this for me? I love you. I have a commission for you. For me? You want to have me work for you? I want you to work for me. I want you to represent me. Absolutely. Anything I can do for you, just tell me. I need you to go back to that prison cell that I took you out of because there's a whole bunch more that need to know about me and my love and my truth. Will you go for me? In a heartbeat, I would, I would gladly serve you any way you want, any way you ask. I need to forewarn you. I'm gonna send you out and you'll be as a sheep among wolves. They'll kill you. They'll destroy you, they'll hate you, they'll persecute you. They will do whatever they can to harm you. I'm in. I'll do it, God. I don't care, you shed your blood for me, I would gladly shed my blood for you. Take my body, take my blood, spend it any way you want. I belong to you in, in covenant. Take me, Lord Jesus, send me. The commission, not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as a son and a daughter of the King of Kings, but we are commissioned to represent him. And I want you to realize that it's a privilege beyond all other privileges to bear the very name, the very image, the very reputation of God Almighty. And he says, I ask you to go. Go and make disciples of all men. Go and be unashamed of my gospel and preach it. Go, rescue the lost in the power of my name. For is not the lamb that was slain worthy to receive the 
reward of his suffering. I'll go. And as you're beginning to head out with his blessing, he says, hold it. Wait, there's one more thing. Not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as a son or a daughter of the king, and not just the commission. This is the capstone. If you think that is all good, you could wrap that all up into one ball and it still falls short of the final one because this final one is so condescending on the part of our king. It is so bewildering, it is so extraordinary, so amazing, and this is the truth that turns the world upside down. Before you go, what I'm sending you out to do is impossible. I know, impossible. And if you do it in your own strength, you'll fail. I don't care. I'm willing to do whatever you ask of me, and if you want me to go in there and just die, I'm willing. I'm sending you out to be a victor. My children will not lose. Would you give me your body? And I will come in and make it my home. And I will take those hands of yours and make them my hands. I will take those feet of yours and make them my feet. I will take that mouth of yours and it will speak my words. I will take those eyes of yours and they can now see what I need you to be seen in this world. And I will take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh so that it will beat with my burdens and you will care for the very things that I care about. And your prayers will become my prayers. And your life and your attitude and your behavior every minute of every day will be the very behavior of God. Will you allow me to overtake your life? Because then we go into this world as little lambs with the faces of lions. Because the living God Almighty, the consuming, almighty, sovereign God dwells within his children. And as we stand and the wolf pack surrounds us, we stand in the authority in the name of Jesus and we will not back down because we do not head off to war to lose. We head off to war to win. Our God mocks all the powers of earth and hell through fluffy little lambs because his lambs beat the wolf packs. That's the gospel. The gospel trounces upon all the powers of earth and hell and demonstrates to the universe the manifold wisdom of God that he is in control. And even though we look weak, and even though physically and naturally we are weak, spiritually greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. That is good news. And it is a lot better than what's being dealt out today in the church. We need to rise up, proclaim the gospel, and say, I'm unashamed of it. Dear Lord Jesus, take what is rightfully yours. Don't just send us. Send us with yourself, firmly planted within our souls. We cannot do your work. We cannot bring you glory, even though we're willing to do it without you. Please, if you want to come with us, why in the world would we ever try on our own? You don't have to go on your own. You don't have to pull off the impossible on your own. You don't have to fail any longer. Your God is ready to do it in and through you. You can't do it. You can't muster up the discipline. You can't muster up the intellect. You can't muster up the strength. You can't muster up the perseverance and the fortitude. He can. You can't love the lost. You can't love those that spit upon your face. He can. Don't pray that God would teach you how to love like he loves. Pray that he would fill you with himself and he would love in and through you. Don't pray that he would teach you to have joy. Pray that the living God full of joy would enter into you. Don't pray that he would teach you how to be peaceful. Ask for the God of peace, the Prince of Peace to infill you. Because if you try and imitate in your own strength, you will be a miserable replica. But if you allow the impartation of Jesus Christ to overtake you, suddenly it all works because it's him imitating himself. And he's very good at being God.
I just want to be real with you guys. There are people in this room who, if they die tonight, are going to hell. And hell is a literal place of gnashing of teeth, of heat that you could never experience, of torture, of agony, eternal agony and eternal. Eternal means forever. And there are people in here tonight that if they died tonight, they would spend eternity in hell. And if you're not sure if that's you, or you're like, I don't want to spend eternity in hell. I just want to encourage you, we've gone over the message of the gospel like five different ways tonight. And we've talked about it. And you are in here, and you know, if you're in here tonight, you know the message of the gospel. You know what it means. But there's one step that, that requires you from going to knowing the gospel to experiencing eternity in heaven. And that one step is repent and believe. It means to believe in the gospel. It means to believe that Jesus came and died for your sins. And not only to believe it, but to repent. It means that you're living a sinful, hellish life and you're saying, I'm going to turn and I'm going to go the other way and I'm going to pursue the things of God and I'm going to pursue the things of Jesus. A lot of you know the message of the gospel, but you haven't yet done this step. You haven't repented and believed in your heart. The Bible says that if someone believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. And if you want to do that tonight, I'm going to encourage you, during this time of reflection, come talk to me. Come talk to one of the other adults in the room. We would love to be able to talk to you about that. Maybe you're like, okay, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've done this step of repenting and believing, but I'm still right here. I'm still trying to recover and pursue God's design for me. I'm still trying to do things in my own strength. I'm still trying in my own strength to be right, to, be, to make the right decisions, to, to, to be perfect. And you're like, and, and every day you're like, I just don't do it. I'm trying, but I'm not there. Stop trying and just let God work through you and let the Holy Spirit come into you and work through you. Maybe someone's in here tonight and, you're, and you've got someone on your mind that you're like, man, I wish they were here to hear this message. I wish they heard the gospel message. I wish they would respond to the gospel message. If, if, that's some, if you have someone in mind, man, grab a ping pong ball, write their name on it, and put it in this box. And begin to pray for that person. And then when the door of opportunity opens, share the gospel with that person. Whatever it feel, you feel like, listen, every one of you in here is feeling a different tug a different response to the message of the gospel that you've heard tonight. Each and every one of you are feeling something different. The Holy Spirit's speaking to you in a different way. And whatever it is, I, I, I can't do it for you. You have to do it. And so as Caitlin plays this song and, and the next song, I just want to encourage you, man, respond how the Holy Spirit is leading you. Whatever it is. Maybe it's uh, standing up and going to talk to somebody in the room and asking forgiveness. Maybe it's sending a text message to somebody that you're praying for that's already in this box and saying, hey, I love you. Let's grab lunch so we can talk about the message of the gospel. I just want you during this time to just do whatever you need to do. And I'm just going to give you freedom for a few minutes just to respond however you want to respond.